So yeah, absolute pleasure to, to, to be here to talk to you today. Um, hello, my name's Simon. I'm from the UK. Uh, I'd love to hear where you're from. So please ping in the chat and I'll say, hey, I'll give you a call out. Um, but I'm going to jump straight in because I think I have about 30 minutes. So I'm going to, is that right, Edson? I have about 30 minutes. So I'm, uh, I'm finishing at about a quarter past ish. Is that, is that correct? Yes, uh, 30 minutes. Per 30 minutes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I'll try, I'll try and do that. Hey, good see you, Nikolai and Raphael. Um, so uh, this is Stranger Danger. So let me go this full screen. Oh, maybe I can't give shout outs because I'm going onto slides. Rubbish. But hey, let's, 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 uh, let's go ahead. Uh, I'm going to do a few slides. Slides are boring, so I'm going to jump into uh, life hacking as soon as I possibly can. This is called Stranger Danger. It's about how we find security vulnerabilities and our applications before well, before they find you, before someone else finds them. Uh, my name's Simon Maple. I uh, run the DevRel team here at SNCC. Uh, at SNCC, we are very uh, fond of creating developer solutions for security. So security solutions for developers, as it were. Uh, how do we get developers uh, being more secure and, and, and using, you know, doing security-focused activities uh, as part of their usual day job? Uh, I've been in Java for well over 20 years now, um, and uh, my background is as an engineer for IBM, working on WebSphere and other amazing middleware products like that. Uh, I, I also run the Virtual Jug, the London Java user group, and I've got a couple of awards there. If you wanted to reach out, please do on Twitter, at sjmaple. Um, Okay, let's start with uh, with something uh, that hopefully everyone is aware of and 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 absolutely loves. I'm sure uh, DevOps. It helps us deliver value very very fast. It allows us to write some code in an IDE and push that to to production later that day, later that hour. We can do it very quick. We can do it often, and we can do it in a predictable way. However, when we do things like that, there are a number of other things that don't fit that model, one of which is security. And that's why DevSecOps uh, is a, a wonderful, incredible buzzword, which, uh, which was created and loved by many. Uh, what, is, what are the problems, though, that something like DevSecOps solves? Well, with this speed up, of people wanting to push code to production often and quickly. Uh, how does things like the traditional security audit, how does that fit in? We do that, uh, from what I understand, once every 25 years where the whole security team come from their dungeon, they come to the developer and they say, no, you cannot push this because we have a hundred vulnerabilities that are open if you push that. So what happens is the developers, they end up hating the security team the security team end up hating the developers because they put in all these shiny libraries. How do we solve this problem? Well, DevSecOps is similar to that DevOps mentality where we try and pull these different silos, these different teams together so that security is made a first class citizen in that pipeline. So every time we push, we, make, we have security considered, we have security tests running, and we know when regressions occur because customer data could be compromised. Yes, Equifax know that all too well, as do any Equifax user. Uh, this was the you know, one of the headliners that that have uh, has made the news over the last few years, uh, and realistically, the reason that this breach occurred and so many millions of U.S. customers um, had their sensitive data breached was because of a, a, a popular library called Apache Struts. Um, and Apache Struts, as we know, is an open source uh, library. One of the reasons why open source libraries are so useful is because everyone can just use them and adopt them and grow uh, based on them. One of the horrible things about open source software is that when there is an issue, whether it's a bug or a security problem, that bug or security problem exists in many, many different uh, places. Now, that's not a criticism of open source. That is that is almost like a, a, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that exists because of the popularity of open source. Now, when we think about something like um, struts, we can see that when the Apache struts vulnerability that affected Equifax uh, was announced, it was you know mid-March, there was the spike in the number of people that were attacked, the number of attacks that occurred uh, rose significantly. And this is because uh, a ex exploit code, test code became available and anyone who was anyone could just run this test code. And I'll show you how anyone who was anyone could run that test code because I'm about to run it now. Um, what I've got, if I come back uh, here, uh, Maximilian, lots of Star Wars stuff. Yes, it's my Millennium Falcon and my Atta. And these are, these are legit toys from the 70s which i got hey mark hey uday hey labina hey uh, vj good to see you all from lots of different places so uh sorry i'm getting uh, i'm getting distracted right let's uh let's go to let's go to my browser uh from here what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you this to do application this is a very simple to do application as you can see i can create a to do let's buy my wife some flowers she definitely deserves them uh flowers there we go let's add a due date 
of uh, the 14th of January, 1970. I better make that high, I guess. Uh, add that there. We have an idea of 11. We have a title. We have a due date, et cetera, et cetera. If I click on about, uh, we can see all the different tools that uh, that we use here, all the different frameworks. We're using Struts, a vulnerable version. We're using Spring at version 3.2, a very early version of Spring. We're using Hibernate uh, because we love to make poor life decisions. So here, because we know we're using uh, a vulnerable version of Struts, we're going to actually exploit that now. So I'm going to come back here, and on this page here, I'm going to show you not in that directory, though. Let's go back one and into my exploits directory. I'm going to show you this headers file. Okay, in this headers file, oh no, that was not what I wanted at all. In this headers file, this is a uh, header that we're going to be sending uh, on a request to my vulnerable struts endpoint. We'll see a content type straight away. That content type is illegal. Uh, so we're going to go straight down into an exception path once we hit this endpoint. Now, it is illegal because of this percent, oops, it is illegal because of this percent and brace, and there's also a brace at the end there. Now, when we go through this uh, exception path, we'll go through a library called OGNL, which as one of the things it can do is it evaluates certain uh, pieces of text to give us a richer uh, output or, or for our error messages, and that's how one of the ways it can be used. Now, it's going to evaluate anything uh, within this percent brace uh, a piece of text, which is great because we've got a bunch of code that can execute here, of which we're going to create a new process builder passing in commands. The commands we're passing in are bash, and bash is going to run a command called cmd. And this is just in big letters command. We can substitute this in just a sec. So let me uh, go to my little crib sheet here. Let's grab this one and I'll, I'll walk you through this as we run it. So I am catting that file, that exploit headers file that I just showed you. We are doing a, a string substitution in, uh, on uh, the command keyword there for env. So this is going to print out our environment variables. I'm just going to curl this to an endpoint. That endpoint currently is set to my local host. But instead, I'm going to point that to get bigger. I'm going to point that to this. And this is my to do application, which is actually, in fact, running on a Heroku app environment. So let's curl our Heroku app application, that to do list. Uh, and now that's all we're going to do. We're going to send just a, a plain uh, curl request, get HTTP request over to that endpoint. We're setting up our uh, header so that we're passing in uh, an illegal content type, which evaluates OGNL will evaluate a piece of that code. If I hit return there, hopefully, after setting all that up, there we go. There are our environment variables. Uh, you can see our Java options. You can see our path. You can see our working directory, our Java home, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And believe you me, some people, not anyone on this call, I'm sure, but some people will put sensitive information into their environment variables. And an evil person like me, evil laugh, will pick that up and potentially do some nasty stuff with that. At this point, I have uh, execution rights. I can write, I can uh, execute commands of my choosing. And that will run under the process and use the privileges uh, of the process, uh, sorry, of the user that is running that process. And in this case, I think this is just a Tomcat server or something like that. So I am now running uh, under the user of that Tomcat service, and I can now execute whatever commands I can under that user. So that was the exploit. Um, let me come back here, and we'll go through a couple more slides, and then we'll start hacking again. So. Lo and behold, this is your application. We have a very small circle in the middle, and that's your code. That's the code that you write in your IDE. And then we have this huge amount of code around the edges. Uh, and these, this is all your open source dependencies. And this is very common to see um, your, your code being the much smaller piece of your application. And it's because we leverage so much amazing open source stuff. So here's a great example. And why don't I ask you uh, if, uh, if I can uh, to, in fact, I can't see it just now. That sucks. But let me ask you to put your answers in the chat as I go through this. There are 19 lines of code in here. There are two direct dependencies. And this is just an application which um, grabs a file and stores it in Amazon's S3. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and I want you to put those answers in to the chat. And I can't see it right now, but as soon as I stop this presentation, I'll be able to see that, and I'll be able to, I'll be able to maybe give a prize to someone. Uh, or maybe it will just be some, some kudos. How many indirect dependencies do you think we have on this application? So we have two direct dependencies. How many indirect or transitives do you think we're going to have on that, uh, on that application? So these are the dependencies that each of those two dependencies will pull in. I'll give you a quick second to, to put, your, put your ideas in there. 
The answer is 19. So only 17 dependencies. Now, I can't see the answers right now, but I'm sure because this is the Java track and not the JavaScript track, everyone's going to be trolling on JavaScript. And they're probably putting in millions, hundreds of millions, dr trillions maybe. But it's just 19. So it's not as bad as it could be. However, now the next question, how many lines of code do you think we're going to be deploying? Is it, uh, this is this is the lines of code in our application there for 19 lines of code in our IDE, plus the number of dependencies that we have. So how many lines of code are in all of that? Now, typically, I'm going to guess right now that some people are putting maybe tens of thousands or, or a certain number of thousands. Some people might go crazy and say, let's put 10 million or something like that. The answer is in between. It's about 191,000, so almost 200,000 lines of code. Now, the key here is, don't just look at what's in your IDE. The application you deploy is 200,000 lines of code here, where the application you see is this 19 lines of code. So be very conscious of what you're deploying. And of course, you're not necessarily going to go through all of those lines of code. They may not all be active and endpoints, but we have to be very conscious of what, do, what we're deploying because what we maintain and what we have to secure is what we deploy. It's not the code in our IDE alone. Uh, how many more slides have I got? Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. I'll go through. Oh, no, I don't want to go through too many slides. Let me go through this one. How, how do we how do we then go about fixing this? So we know there are vulnerabilities. We know we sometimes introduce them ourselves. We know sometimes. Uh, sorry, we know sometimes we introduce them with our pull requests. We know sometimes they're introduced in existing code that we've deployed into production. We need to know and test at every stage. And the key thing here is testing early. This is like the typical shift left or giving that responsibility to the developer to make sure they're empowered enough to test their code before they push to, to a repo. To, to maintain that, when they do get to the repo, tests are made so that people can understand if they're introducing new vulnerabilities and can't regress. And also so that when we get to, to production, even if today there are no known vulnerabilities in our code, in our, in our open source libraries and open source uh, projects, even though there's nothing there today, what if there's something that is found tomorrow or a week later or a year later? If we're not going through this pipeline, who is testing for that? And how do we know that these new things have, uh, have come around? So these are some of the things that when you think about, I'm happy to, to, to talk. I mean, you can see some little SNCC logos here. I'm happy to talk about this offline as well. If people are interested in learning about how SNCC can do that. Um, but let's, let's hack. Let's go terminal. So uh, I'm going to jump uh, to, here we go. Oh, actually, let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at what people thought. So actually, so okay, so so not too bad. 20, 54, 42, 14, leap from Sebi, nice one, 200 indirect. So of around the same kind of uh, the same kind of number as we had. 1500 lines of code, 29k from Osama, 1800, 54,000, 100,000. So yeah, everyone was pretty low. Sebi with another ridiculous uh, answer. That's awesome. I love it, Sebi. Uh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, right, let's uh, let's jump to another application. This is actually a Node application. Two reasons. Uh, one because it doesn't matter too much. Um, it's uh, a vulnerability is a vulnerability, and we're just going to exploit a particular vulnerability here called directory traversal. Uh, and secondly, it's actually more fun to, to hack Node because it's easier. Uh, so, well, that's a lie, but that's what I say from a Java background anyway. Uh, OK, so this is a to-do list application. I'm going to buy some milk. Uh, that's my to-do. Uh, there we go. There's my to-do. There's my little to-do. Let's, uh, let's buy my wife some more flowers. Buy wife flowers. At uh, these regular to do, I can also click on about um, the best is to do app ever, uh, just an about page which has been served from us as a static file. This is all fine. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we can scan this. So, I'm going to do it from both sides the blue side as well as the, the red side. So, let's go ahead and scan this. Uh, I'm going to go into my integrations. Uh, this is just using SNCC, but uh, you can use uh, whatever you wish. Uh, from here, I am going to go into my repo. And I'm going to open up Goof. And what we're now doing is we're connecting to GitHub. We're looking at the uh, the Goof application from GitHub, and we're now going to uh, we're now going to uh, try and find the manifest files which are in that application. From the manifest files, we'll be able to build up a uh, a dependency graph, and we can see where vulnerabilities exist in that dependency graph. So if I was to view the log here, this shouldn't take too long. Uh, in fact, it's already found the it's already found the, the the JSON package, so it's recognized it's a it's a JavaScript node. Uh, application uh, and any second now, and it takes literally a few seconds. Uh, it'll, it'll. Uh, we can view the project. In fact, 
and hopefully see uh, see the snapshot here. Here we go. Okay, so we can see the number of dependencies. And this is a great way of looking at your bill of materials. You can see direct dependencies, transitives, and where your vulnerabilities exist. But what we want to do is look at a specific directory traversal. Uh, and of a directory traversal, here we go. A directory traversal vulnerability uh, is one whereby we are we have maybe access to a specific uh, a vulnerability, uh, and we are looking at how we can uh, potentially break out of that. Uh, uh, sorry, we have access to a directory and we're looking at how we can break out of that directory uh, into a, potentially a private directory or something like that. So how are we going to do that? Let's have a look. This is coming from an EST module. So the ST module is one in which provide it uh, serves public, uh, sorry, serves static content uh, to users. So let me go back over to the application. Um, how, let's, let's ask in the comments, how are we going to hack this? Let's do this together. We want to hack this. It's a directory traversal. Any ideas of, of where we even start? Which part of the application do we want to attack? Which part of the application do we want to hack? Uh, so, so yeah, please do... Um, uh, please do uh, ping in the comments as to as to which page or how I should go about doing that. Uh, and we'll I'm not going to hack this. You're going to hack this. So let's 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 try and uh, let's try and do this together. What do you think? OK, nothing just yet. So the two, it's it's there's nothing in the uh, there's nothing I haven't shown you. It's uh, it's these two pages, the about page uh, and this page with uh, with looking for, uh, for for ideas in the input box, in the input field, in the text box. OK, what should I what should I do here? Uh, in, in inject code into the data to be evaluated and dot dot slashes. OK, dot dot slashes. So dot dot slashes in here, maybe. Add dot dot slash to the URL. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So which URL? The uh, the home page or perhaps our about page? If we look at our about page, maybe maybe our about page. Whoops, maybe our about page is a little bit more interesting. So if we look at our about, it's got uh, it's got a directory structure in there. So if I come back here, uh, let's go to a, a fresh go to a fresh page and let's curl it. Okay, so there's our uh, there's our um, whoops. There's a there's a about page. There's our about uh, document. We can see uh, this is the URL, um, and we want to do a dot dot slash. I presume so. Add, add Chris Chris Holmes is saying add dot dot slash to the to the URL. So something like this. Okay. Hopefully this is going to work. Let's see if this works. Uh, okay. So we can see. This is just some HTML. We can see by my wife and flowers. We see the dot dot slash. We see by milk. This is actually the homepage. Uh, goof to do homepage. So what's happened is ST is a ST is a real library. Okay, it's a real library that recognizes we're trying to do a dot dot slash. So we're on the right lines, but it, we can't type dot dot slash because it is, it is looking for dot dot slash. Okay, Mark Harding, awesome. Mark Harding has suggested replace with percent two e instead of a dot. Now. Uh, percent two e is, as all great hackers know, well done, Mark Harding, is the URL encoding of a dot. So if we do a dot dot as URL encoding, what we're suggesting here is that ST isn't going to uh, be looking for percent two e, and it's not going to be normalized because we're sending curl. So if I do this, bang, we have a uh, our directory traversal. We can see that because we're outside of the public directory. And I'm just going to quickly go back to my uh, browser, and in fact. While I'm doing, while I'm going to show you back in the browser, think about what you want me to do next. Think about an, as an as an attacker, what would you do if you if you uh, just broke in and started looking at this? Where where would you want to go? To, so think about that just for a second. In the meantime, what I'm going to do is from here, I'm going to do exactly the same thing with percent two e percent two e forward slash. And by doing percent two e percent two e here. We actually get back to the home page, and that is because my browser normalizes the percent two e. It turns that it, it, it decodes that back into a dot before sending that. Okay, and as a result, uh, as a result, it, it, the, the ST directory does see the uh, the the directory. So it does see the dots, and as a result, knows it's a it's a it's a. Uh, uh, directory traversal. So Marco wants to do something crazy. Look, RM minus RF, the DB directory. So what is this? Let's go back to let's go back to our, our vulnerability. Uh, oops. Let's go back to our vulnerability and see what our vulnerability is. So if I was to come back here, uh, we're in directory traversal, right? So if I was to go into directory traversal, 
and let's click on more about this issue. We can see this is our CVSS score. So our CVSS score is is you know the the the, the score out of ten uh, based on the um, how the vulnerability or how by exploiting this vulnerability uh, the how much pain you'd get based on what it can do. Uh, what kind of buildup you need, what is the attack vector, etc. And you can see that the scope here is unchanged. So what unchanged means is if someone were to exploit this, you can you're effectively read only. You can't make changes to the to the end system. So this is just as a result of us doing this, we can only read. So that's a good idea, Marco. Uh, but what can we read? Well, let's have a look. In this directory, um, we've got a whole bunch of stuff. So we could have a look at, why don't we have a look at the app.js? See our source code here. Uh, maybe we do something instead. Maybe we have a look at our package, uh, package dot, no, what was it? Uh, package dot JSON. Uh, and look, here's all our other direct dependencies, which we could potentially, uh, uh, try and find other vulnerabilities to. So maybe we could see something like humanize MS is an interesting one. Uh, humanize MS has a, uh, let's have a look at it. Humanize MS has another vulnerability in it. Oops, did not mean to do that. Uh, humanize MS. Let's let's do a quick search on Humanize MS. Humanize. Uh, it's got a uh, a redos. Uh, it's marked, fresh, marked, marked. Moment braces marked. Humanize MS. Okay, Humanize MS pulls in MS, which pulls in. Uh, uh, Sorry, a, a hum and that has uh, a regular expression uh, uh, directory traverse. So regular expression denial of service. So let's try and hack this. What is what is this first of all? Well, a regular expression we know what that is. A denial of service we know what that is. A regular expression denial of service is by computing a regular expression which takes so many cycles. We are we are effectively taking up uh, the resources so much. Could be computational. Could be something else. But we could cause a denial of service on that thread. So let's try and uh, cause an exploit right now. If I go back here, uh, what you'll see is if I was to say uh, by milk, but this time in 30 seconds, no, let's say, yeah, 30 seconds. No, let's go two days. What it's done is it's it's parsed that. It recognizes I'm doing in followed by a time. And as a result, it's turned that into milliseconds so I can maybe do something like a, um, I don't know, a, a, a reminder or a notification. And then it's just representing it here in braces as 2D. So what I could do is provide a string which causes this thing called a catastrophic backtracking. And catastrophic backtracking is where I would do something along the lines of that. And this is a string whereby I can type a pattern like A and a number of Bs, and that will match. However, if I type A and a number of Bs and then a C, this number of Bs can be matched in a number of different ways. It could be matched by the plus, or it could be matched by the star, or a combination thereof. So it could maybe do the first couple with the plus, the next couple with another plus because of the star, and so on. We don't know. But as soon as it gets to a C, some uh, regular expression engines will backtrack and will try and find all permutations of this B plus B plus star, whereby it'll try and match these Bs and see if we can find a C at the end. Of course, that will never happen, but it will try and exhaust all those possibilities. And as the number of Bs in here grows, the, the number of steps exponentially grow that we need to exhaust. So let me come back here and let's actually try that. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly uh, type MS2. I'm going to, just to save my typing, I'm going to try and send this. I'm going to echo some content. It says buy milk in, and then we're going to print out 60 character fives minutes. Okay. And we're going to send that across. So I execute that. There we go. Buy milk in, and there's 60 fives minutes. Okay, is this going to actually cause a uh, uh, denial of service? Well, let's ramp this up to 600, 6,000, 60,000. Run that again. It comes back very, very quickly. And if I was to come back to my uh, refresh this page, you can see the, res the requests are coming in just fine, despite that being infinity days. Uh, the requests are coming in just fine. However, the problem here, the reason we're not getting a, uh, a, a delay is because this... Uh, actually resolves first time it finds the match what we need to do is stop it from finding that match and we can do that 
by just adding a typo at the end. So now it has to parse through all these fives. It gets to minutes, but because there's an instead of an S here, we're replacing that with an A, it's going to backtrack through all of these fives. So if I hit return there, we hang, we pause. I'll come back here and I'll type hello. And I'll hit my oops, I'll hit my keyboard hard. And despite it making a loud noise, nothing happens until which time is that times out or the number of permutations uh, complete. And any minute about now, uh, that thread comes back and it executes. It goes to all those other um, it goes to all those other requests. So regular expression denial of service uh, through uh, a re uh, sorry. A, a denial of service through a regular expression being way, way too long. Uh, ways you can fix this, of course, you could, you know, look at the look at the the string you get, and if your string is anywhere near this size, uh, you would you would you know make sure you can't uh, you you won't parse that. You would you would uh, not even look at it. Another way is up is you know fixing the uh, th fixing the actual vulnerability um, by going up to a newer version of your of your library. Now, in this case, the vulnerable module is MS. The uh, the the library which is pulling in ms so this is our direct dependency is humanize ms at 101 the fix is to upgrade humanize ms to 102 and this is the minimum version which pulls in a fixed version of ms okay so now if i was to go in and click fix this vulnerability uh the idea being this is going to now send a request back to uh back over to uh, github and let me just click now open a fixed pull request and we'll see uh we'll see this uh, you know working nicely in uh, in conjunction there so i click on files change you can see the file uh that we changed there 102 versus uh versus 101 what you'll also see is a number of other things in that i am making checks on all of my uh all of my uh you know changes to make sure our delta uh, doesn't get uh, doesn't get affected. So, are we introducing any new changes uh, into uh, into in, you know into our repository based on this pull request? And those are both license changes uh, and uh, and SNCC in terms of the uh, 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 vulnerabilities. So, we can do this at various stages. Uh, here, I've shown you the uh, the the, uh, the the repo. Uh, you can also, if I was to come over here, maybe and say, let's do this via a, a repository. Here is um, here is that Java goof, um, a Java goof application, which I've just got in IntelliJ. I've done a quick scan. You can scan whichever Maven project you want, and you can see all the vulnerabilities here. And I can click on one of these to say, let's upgrade a specific version. The suggested upgrades are always given here. Um, and I can just kind of like come, come along, click, and it'll show me which version I need to upgrade. Uh, so this is super important, but I think there are a number of other things other than tooling, which are, which are extremely important. Uh, and that is that are, thing, that are things like, uh, you know, changing that mentality to, to pulling security in earlier uh, in the development environment having security mavens that exist in your uh, in your development team so that there are individual developers that recognize and understand uh, that you get um, that you know you get much much um, uh, uh, you know more experience and expertise in the develop in the development stage uh, also Code reviews are absolutely key, making sure that when you go through a code review, you're not just looking at code of your, that you're writing, but also code uh, that you're pulling in. Um, one other thing, actually, I'll show you is uh, if I go to uh, my pull requests. Uh, one other thing that's really, really important, and I'll, I'll show it in SNCC here, but you can you'll you know you can do this however you like, uh, is what happens when you get a uh, vulnerability that is uh, that's existed for ages in your production environment, but that hasn't been known. Well, one of the things that we can do here is uh, raise an automatic pull request. So this is an automatic pull request, which, you know, you're just kind of like running in the background uh, by that's happening automatically. You don't actually have to put anything through the pipeline. Uh, and, and what you'll see here is uh, a, a, a file change that has occurred. This is the this is the smallest version jump you can get, which includes this fix. Uh, and this is that the project has had vulnerabilities that couldn't be fixed or couldn't be patched because no upgrade was available. But now new upgrades have been made available. Uh, and as a result, we can automatically we automatically send a pull request which can patch that. Very similar if it's a new vulnerability that wasn't known previously. So there's a whole bunch of other things like this that can be done, but it's all about making 
uh, putting security into the developer flow and the developer uh, workflow. Um, that's uh, that's everything I've got to say. I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed. I think I'm pretty much at time now. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, and uh, happy to take questions um, if uh, if there are any. Simon, you are perfectly on time. Thank you very much. Excellent. Yeah, British as usual. And <laughs> in the chat, like sure. uh, yeah, the last one. Uh, question: Snick, uh, Snick, Sync, Snick, Snick versus White Source Bolt. Okay, yeah. So White Source uh, uh, again, an SCA tool. Uh, so now we know, right, Sebi? That's what Snick stands for. Uh, yeah, White Source is a, is a, is a uh, another tool that does uh, similar things. Uh, from our point of view, uh, we have uh, our the way we work is from a very developer first oriented way. So. Uh, everything that we do is focused on developers. And I think if you were to try both together, uh, you will, you know, enjoy the SNCC, uh, the SNCC way of working, the way it uh, allows you to do things in a much in a much more kind of like developer friendly way. Uh, we also have, uh, in, in certainly in my opinion, and, and also a number of uh, other people who are, who are, uh, who are using our, our database. Uh, we have a number of major groups using our database. We have an entire uh, security team, which really do uh, some amazing work in both uh, finding new vulnerabilities and also working with uh, vendors that do that. So I think I, I would say our, our, our vulnerability database is more complete in, in that sense as well. Um, but I would say, you know, it's all about user experience. Uh, and I think you'll find if you use SNCC, uh, you can, you'll see the differences. It's very much more like a, uh, would you use, I, would you use IntelliJ or would you use Eclipse? It's all about that user experience. So give, give that a go. Uh, and I think you'll find, a, 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 you know, there's significant difference in, in terms of the usability. Amazing. I couldn't right. see any more questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. so, well, Simon, I was amazed by what Snick can do. So yes, maybe I should run it on my projects. Absolutely. My project, if it's, they are vulnerable. Absolutely. And yeah, if you, if you, if you want, you know, it's, in, it's entirely, we have paid plans, but it's entirely free just to go ahead and sign up and you can use that both at, uh, both, the, you know, as I've shown in, in the, in the repo, as well as with Docker scanning, we're already integrated with, uh, with Docker on Docker desktop and things like that. So you're more than welcome to kind of like try all that out for free uh, and use that month on month. So please, please do go ahead and try it out. Awesome. So, uh, in, uh, well, in, in behalf of the Dev Nation organizing team, Thank you very much, Simon, for this amazing presentation, and I hope to see you soon in the next opportunity. Thanks very much. A pleasure, pleasure to speak, so thank you for having me.